Another lesson on carburetors. This time for all the young people I'll explain exactly how they work and show you more details with car carburetors. So now the theory. Here I've drawn a picture of what a carburetor would look like if it was sliced in half down through the middle longitudinally. It's very simplified but it gives you the basic idea how they all work. You have your float chamber I didn't draw the float, but that's the bowl that holds the fuel. It only holds it about three quarters of the way up. Air input, where it attaches to the engine. Throttle plate. This restricted area in the middle is called the venturi. When air passes, this mass of air passes through a smaller space, it speeds up. And when it speeds up, the pressure decreases. And that causes the air pressure that's on the fuel here then to be greater and it pushes fuel up through that tiny jet it's not, this is called the main jet comes up through the venturi and comes out as little blobs of fuel as the little blobs are traveling in this direction through the air they hit the throttle plate and splatter on it and that help evaporates them to make them into fumes because the engine can't burn liquid fuel very well it burns fumes when the engine's idling the throttle plate is almost closed all the time so there's a tiny little hole, or a couple of holes, right by where the throttle plate meets the body of the carburetor. There's a tiny jet on the bottom of that suction tube too, and an idle mixture screw. Many vehicles have their idle mixture screw blocked off so you can't adjust them. Oh kitty, get out of the way. And they do that for emissions reasons. They'll often put a hardened steel cap over top of a screw that's in a hole and you have to take the carburetor off and grind your chisel around that steel cap, pry it out, and then you can adjust your car because when they get older they don't necessarily idle properly. An engine burns far less than a drop of fuel for each cylinder when it's firing. It probably burns one hundredth of a drop of fuel per each cylinder when it's firing. Because an engine burns fumes, not liquid fuel, and it has to have a lot of air in there to get the right mixture. One gallon of gas has the equivalent energy of 40 sticks of dynamite, but in liquid form it has no energy. It's not explosive at all. Once you mix it properly with air, about 14 or 15 times air compared to fuel, then it becomes very powerful. Here is a General Motors Rochester four barrel carburetor. They're called four barrels because it's actually four different carburetors all in one body. There's four Venturis. Here's a Holly double float bowl, single feed. These car and carburetors are, are more loved for racers and street tuners because you can take, take the float ball tank off really easy without removing the carburetor or taking apart complicated things like you do on this carburetor. And then you just take the four screws out and right there at the bottom you can very easily change the jets. So you can tune your car right on the track very quickly. All car carbs have these vent tubes. This one goes down there and comes out there. And another one for this tank over here. That's your fuel tank on the carb, the bowl. And this carb has its bowl sort of all around this side. So it has one vent. If you had a car sit for a long time and you think the carburetor's dried out and it might take a while to get started, a really good trick is to get a squeezy bottle or something fill it full of gas and fill up these vent holes. That'll fill up the float chamber and prime your carburetor. So on this one you would have to fill both vent holes. Makes a big difference for starting. On these carburetors the fuel travels through that little tube and comes out this venturi area in the middle. So there's four of those. The venturi is in the secondary barrels which when you use when you're having wide open throttle or you know what you want to accelerate really quickly are a lot bigger than the ones here. And the jets are bigger too on this side. So for example on this carburetor the jets would be bigger here and this is the part your car runs on most of the time and this is a choke plate and your jets would be much smaller. When you step on the gas in your car and accelerate you're moving the throttle. Well that's moving the two throttle plates that are in the smaller part of the four barrel carburetor where the smaller venturis are and where the choke is. Now that the carburetor is turned around, 
when you're accelerating hard and your RPMs pick up to a certain amount and there's a certain amount of vacuum created in your carburetor, this housing here is a vacuum slave cylinder and this little rod lifts up and when this little rod lifts up it allows the secondaries or your four barrels to open up so you can get full throttle. If all four opened at the same time that would make your engine just go blah and just like bog right out because there wouldn't be enough air being sucked through the carburetor at the engine going in low enough RPMs to cause enough vacuum in here to suck the fuel out of the Venturi's. So that's why these open up in a delayed fashion when the RPMs increase. All carbs have what's called an accelerator pump. This little lever here moves up and down every time you work the throttle back and forth and that's just a little piston, a neoprene one, in the bottom of the tank that holds the fuel and that squirts some fuel into this side of the carburetor every time you accelerate just so that you don't get that bog until the RPMs pick up. If you look really closely here when I move the throttle you can see those tiny holes I was talking about that allow the idle mixture fuel to come in. On this Rochester carburetor the accelerator pump is on the top and the piston is right there. This Holly carb has been set up for a racer use off a Mustang GT and he's got the choke mechanism set for manual usage. This Rochester carburetor is almost complete on the choke mechanism. Now I have the choke closed. The way to start a not fuel injected car when it's cold, hit the gas once, hold the throttle down a little bit and see what happens. Of course if it's really cold you might have to pump it a few times as that squirts gas in through the accelerator pump. Now this little diaphragm slave cylinder, whatever you want to call it, is a choke pull off. As soon as the car starts, vacuum is created, a little tube here, and this thing is, this pin is sucked in, and as you see it opens the choke a little bit. The choke is opening just so the car will keep running so it won't flood out, but it needs to be fully closed when the car starts so that it is enough fuel to start. The choke will stay open, for example, that much until the car starts to warm up more. This car doesn't have the electric choke heater on the side, it's not that kind of carburetor, so it would have had a curled up bimetallic strip in a pocket inside the intake manifold where some hot exhaust went through the intake manifold which helps warms up the carburetor and that warms up the thing called the choke heater and another rod would be attached here and then as the engine warmed up that coil would unwind, push that rod and finish opening the choke in a delayed fashion when your engine warmed up. Some of these choke pull-off things are adjustable by turning a screw back here the reason you want to adjust them is because when your car starts when it's cold, if it's chugging and making too much black smoke and wants to stall, it's flooding out so this has to be adjusted so it opens a little bit more. The other reason why you would want to adjust it is, well every time you start your car it starts fine, but then it immediately stalls so every time you put it in gear, well then you want to adjust it so that it stays more closed so it's running richer. Some of them have a, a little loop in this rod and you can squeeze the loop this way or open it up and that's how you adjust them. If you start your car and your choke doesn't pop open a little bit, you have a leak in the diaphragm in here and you have to replace this part which is actually pretty simple. So on the Holly carb, the jets are on the side and they'd be on the same place here on the other side. On the Rochester carb and many other carbs, if you split the carb here in half and take the top off, the two jets are pointing vertical on the bottom. Another thing that a lot of carburetors have is a thing called a power valve. That's this little lever system here and that lever attaches to two needles that hang down in two jets. It's not quite the same on this carburetor. When you're accelerating hard and your engine hasn't picked up the RPMs yet, it needs more fuel because it just can't suck it enough yet because there's not enough airflow through here. So when you're doing that, the power valves lift up and allow more fuel to come out two extra jets and then once the engine's running at better RPM they stop functioning. On many General Motors carburetors and including this one, especially Rochester carburetors, the fuel filter is in here. It's not very big so it actually plugs pretty quickly if you have a dirty tank. So you hold this with a wrench 
and then you hold this with a wrench and you turn one of them to loosen it so you don't turn the whole thing at the same time and twist your line off when you want to change the fuel filter in there. Some people get confused in their GM cars when they can't find a fuel filter somewhere outside on the body. Multi-port fuel injected cars, which means each cylinder has its own injector right by the valve, often have more horsepower than a similar carbureted car. One of the reasons is they don't have all these venturi things in the way blocking airflow. They just have a plenum and an, an intake runners, so the air gets to flow directly into the motor unrestricted, and the injector is just sort of out of the way on the edge of the tube. Also, injectors fire the fuel out in a really fine spray mist, so there's, it gets so it gets aerosolized, which means particleized in the air, a lot better. So that makes more power for more efficient burning. On this Holly carb, you can see the float right there. The needle's in behind there, and you can adjust it to get access to it through that screw. Pretty good design. Whenever you're working on a carb, always shake the float and listen to see that there's no gas inside. Sometimes floats leak and you wonder why your car's running too rich, because it's heavier and it's sitting a little bit too low and allowing the fuel level to be too high, which almost acts like the jets are too big. Well, that was a pretty rough overview of carburetors. But anyways, it'll help a lot of younger people understand how they work. And some people still like carburetors, and I don't.